Hello YouTube, back once again with my film reviews, and I have seen every movie I've wanted to see from 2017, which means it's time to do the top 10 list of 2017, so... I remember saying at the end of last year, at the end of when I was making my top 10 list for 2016, I said, here's to hoping that 2017 is just as good, if not better, because if there's any time I would need films to take my mind off the real world, it would be now. Well, yeah, things did get, certainly did get worse this year. I was shocked. I was one of the people who walked into 2017 saying, well, let's look on the bright side. It's not like it could be worse than 2016. Well, it, uh, it was. And, uh, but, you know, what wasn't bad? Cinema. Film was fantastic this year. This was one of the hardest years I have ever had making a top 10 list. There were so many fantastic films in so many different genres, so before we get into the top 10 list though, there's some other films we have to talk about quickly. Well, first let me name the worst movie of 2017. This year it has to go once again to DC with Justice League, and once again, yes, there are technically worse movies out there, like there were films like The Snowman this year, but... Justice League, though, once again, it was a film that, it, it, it made me the, a, it made me uh, the, the saddest uh, Justice League. I was going to say angriest, but no, because the film reached a level of such unbelievable and intense mediocrity. I didn't even know it was possible that I would, I didn't even get angry at it. Like, I had to dr drink after it because I was just so brain dead and just so done with film after I saw that, and... It's the fact it was Justice League, I mean, this was coming off the success of Wonder Woman, and this, in one fell swoop, destroyed any goodwill I have left for the DCEU. And all I can say after this film, if it isn't uh, Gal Gadot Wonder Woman or Ben Affleck's Batman, I don't give a shit anymore about the DCEU. Now, for most disappointing film this year, I have to give it to Kingsman The Golden Circle. On the whole, I did like this movie, I didn't think it was a bad movie by any stretch of the imagination, but... It was just one of those sequels that was a complete rehash of the original, just, and just definitely not as good because it's not as, as original. But it was, it really sucked with this one because with this film, like, every single thing they could have done to make an expansion on the original instead of just a rehash, the director just kind of went the opposite way with it and just made it a, a rehash of the original. Like, this, like... They kill off Roxy in the first, like, five minutes. Like, I always, I thought that was one of the best things about the original Kingsman. The fact that they had a, a man and woman in this film who were just, had, were, had a good friendship and they didn't do any sort of romantic relationship with them. They kill her off in the first five minutes. Uh, then, then the statesman, who you would think the film was going to be about, um, Eggsy teaming up with these guys to fight the new villains. They're barely in the film, the statesman. I mean, Channing Tatum is a cameo in this film. Like, by all means, Channing Tatum is nothing more but a glorified cameo in this film. And, yeah, then they bring back, um... Colin Firth, which is nice and all, but once again, like, this just all made it feel like just a complete rehash of the original and set an expansion, and... Yeah, so it was just really disappointing, because this could have been way better than it was. So, I'm going to name what I found the biggest losers out of uh, 2017 this year, and that has to go to Cinemac Universes, outside of Marvel, of course. At first, I was going to give this to studios and their hatred for Rotten Tomatoes and blaming them for all their financial fail failures, but hey, I realized... A lot of those films were the try to be the launch points for Cinematic Universes, mainly with uh, the Dark Universe and the DCEU. I mean, Jesus Christ, the Justice League, what was supposed to be the biggest movie of all time to even break a hundred million opening weekend. Most solo Marvel films are able to do that nowadays. I mean, uh, Warner Brothers, you are truly pathetic, and I also... So is Universal, and both of them, like, there's now just this question, are they, are they even gonna continue trying to make their cinematic universes because they both have failed so epically? So. But on a brighter note, let's what I talk about what I thought was the biggest winner out of anyone in Hollywood this year, and that definitely has to go to woman in Hollywood. I'm not talking about the Harvey Weinstein, uh, Weinstein scandal here. What I mean is for all the Hollywood executives who thought putting a woman in the leading role would mean it wouldn't appeal to as broad of an audience, well... Do you know what the three highest grossing uh, d uh, domestic films were this year? They were the Beauty and the Beast remake, Wonder Woman, and of course Star Wars The Last Jedi, all female-led, and they were the three high gross highest grossing films of this year, so... Yeah. Before the top ten, let's talk about my honorable mentions, and there's a lot because this, like I said, it was a fantastic year for film, and I really struggled making a top ten list. There were so many films I considered putting on this list, and these are the those films. So first, uh, Baby Driver. Uh, 
fantastic heist film. I'll always remember this film as the last time I will ever enjoy Kevin Spacey in a film. And yeah, just it was it had a fantastic soundtrack, had fantastic action. Edgar Wright's just a great director. It's a great movie all around. Uh, Happy Death Day, one of those brilliant B movies I've seen in a long time. This was such a great parody of the slasher genre in which it took the character who you want to see die first who is, and does die first, but uh, and then makes it that since she has to keep reliving the same day, she eventually becomes the character you want to see survive and does survive. And this film was so tongue in cheek. There's literally a scene where they sat down and start talking about Groundhog's Day with Bill Murray. How can you not love a movie that does that? So, uh, Ingrid Goes West. Highly doubt you've ever heard of this film. It's a... I really love this movie because my only thought after watching was like, you know, this was only a few rewrites away from being the next Black Mirror episode. The, uh, a great uh, commentary on the uh, the dangers of Instagram and just posting everything about your life online. Uh, Aubrey Plaza is horrifying and utterly uncomfortable as the stalker Ingrid, and Elizabeth Olsen is <laughs> enjoyably obnoxious as like this super hipster Instagram uh, user, and uh, they were great with each other. Uh, and I did I gave the film a lot of credit. It didn't really beat you over the head with the message until like the last five minutes. But before then, Anthony could just uh, keep me in somewhat subtle. So yeah, uh, Ingrid Goes West. Uh, Coco uh, wasn't a fan of the first two thirds. I was in a packed house with kids and they look kind of bored by the first two thirds. But that last third though, that was easily some of Pixar's best work. I mean, I think this is the first time I've ever seen in a Pixar film or a Disney film in recent memory, seeing cold-blooded murder take place, which is kind of amazing. And uh, yeah, uh, last third had fantastic heart, fantastic emotion, uh, fantastic emotion. Um, had a great soundtrack. Yeah, go go. Uh, definitely see it. It's a definitely great uh, animated film. Uh, the Beauty and the Beast remake. Now I must admit there may be a bit of biasness going on with this one because when I saw this film, I was just at a funeral. I was failing out of one of my courses, and my car had just broken down. So I was in a pretty rough spot at that point. So I just really wanted to see a movie like this, just something that was kind of unapologetically pleasant and nice to watch. And that's what Beauty and the Beast, the Beauty and the Beast remake make is. It's a very pleasant film. The I know the complaints, yeah, Emma Watson by no means is a, is a good singer, but I didn't think she was a terrible singer, but I will say this, uh, the voice cast, though, they got to this film was fantastic, especially Ewan McGregor, who almost, this, who almost comes off like this has always been a bizarre dream of his to vo voice Lumineer in Beauty and the Beast, because he just has so much, so much passion in every line he says in that film, and uh, I also love what they do with Gaston, making him a much more sympathetic character. I think we're hinting he had PTSD, if I'm not mistaken, so, yeah, uh, Beauty and the Beast remake, it just, it cheered me up when I needed it, so, yeah. Uh, the Disaster Artist. Now, I was very torn on putting this on the list, but, uh, either this or the biopic that did make the list, but either way, The Disaster Artist, I just love this movie. A fantastic story, uh, of The Room. It really, I read the book, and this does a fantastic justice to the book. They don't really... They more just skip over things than change things. There is actually one big change that they made. I was very upset by that. It was that uh, Greg Sestero, who plays Mark in the room, was not supposed to be in the room. It was only after Tommy was so offered him a new card, a very large sum of money he agreed to be in it. And I, I, I thought that was one of those mind-blowing parts of the... Uh, original story of the disaster arts, but even, even then had fantastic, uh, unbelievably good performances, James Franco as Tommy was so, and it's just such an amazing performance just for the fact that no one really knows who Tommy was so is at the end of the day, so, um, the fact he was able to do that good of a performance out of a, uh, pretty much a complete enigma of a man is just incredible, and if you're a fan of The Room, this is definitely a must-watch. It is so fantastic, and it is so great how they get to, like, how detailed they get in recreating certain scenes from The Room, so, uh, The Disaster Arts, if you like The Room, definitely go see this. Uh, Thor Ragnarok, uh, Marvel once again had a completely uh, another really solid year. Thor Ragnarok was I thought was but definitely their best one, hands down the best of the Thor trilogy by far. The Hemsworth was great. I, Hemsworth was great. Uh, I was so happy to see Mark Ruffalo again. The, it got me excited for Avengers: Infinity War, and uh, yeah, just a ton, uh, an adventure that was just a ton of fun. If you were disappointed with Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two, I'd say definitely watch this. This was seemed to be. Much, uh, very much, uh, the better for, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 than Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 was. So, uh, yeah, uh, Wonder Woman, uh, 
Gal Gadot is just excellent, easily one of the best people playing a superhero at the moment. Uh, I love, I appreciate this film so much for finally bringing a female-led superhero film to the big screen, because I always said, I'm always amazed that, really TV for a while, I know a lot of people say there's no female um, representation for superheroes, there is on TV, mainly with the CW and uh, Jessica Jones on Netflix, I, and... The reason they work is because it, they're just superhero shows and f that just happen to star a woman, and that's e exactly what Wonder Woman was. It was a super, an incredibly well-made superhero film that just happened to star a woman, and Gal Gadot was brilliant. Uh, Chris, P she had fantastic chemistry with Chris Pine. I gotta say, actually, a bit more of a clever plot than I thought it would. Just how the fact that they used World War One over the far easier World War Two, since it kind of messed with Wonder Woman's whole ideas of good and evil, since there was no real good and evil in World War One. So, uh, yeah, uh, Wonder Woman. So happy this film was as big a success as it was. Oh, and uh, since this film was such a critical and financial success, can we finally admit? the reason that the Ghostbusters reboot was both a critical and commercial failure is not because the majority of us are sexist, but because it just wasn't a very good movie. Uh, good Time, uh, another indie film from this year. Just a, I want to say about this one, just a fantastic heist film for getting to end. Uh, it's really intense. Uh, if you ever need proof that Robert Pattinson, the guy who said, it's the skin of a killer, Bella, uh, he could actually act fantastically, definitely watch this. Uh, he's just wonderful in this, and it's just such a great movie, uh, yeah, good time, uh, good, good heist film, uh, Logan Lucky, one of the funniest movies of 2017, um, another heist film, god, there's a lot of heist movies this year, um, uh, basically, basically, o Ocean's Eleven, just with rednecks instead of, like, super, like, uh, cl intelligent, clever people, and, uh, they even say at one point, they're, like, this, the robbery's being called the Ocean 7-Eleven, <laughs> that's a brilliant line, and, uh, it's just, the cast was amazing, Chan Channing Tatum, Adam Driver, Daniel Craig, and Bradley Keough were all fantastic, uh, had me laughing my ass off, and the big reveal at the end of what they, exactly they did with the buddy was just so, so funny. So, if you want a good gobby, definitely go watch Logan Lucky. It comes at night, probably the most depressing movie I watched this year. Just, just an absolutely miserable experience of a horror film about a very much a film where they make it very clear from the word go that there's really no hopes for these people, but it, it's kind of how long can they survive in this situation, and... It's it's dark, it's miserable, it's intense as hell, the acting's fantastic, it's just, if you want to be really depressed, definitely watch that film. Uh, Wind River, not much to say about this one, um, just a fantastically made uh, mystery crime drama, uh, Jeremy Renner and Elizabeth Olsen have fantastic chemistry, and this is probably the closest I'll ever get to uh, seeing the Hawkeye and Scarlet Witch team up I've ever always wanted to see. That, and uh, the ending was one of the most intense endings in, I can remember in uh, recent cinema. Just a complete white-knuckle uh, uh, shootout of an ending. So, yeah, if you like police drama, uh, poli uh, pl police mystery thrillers, don't think I've seen this one. Uh, and finally, three build sports outside of Ebbing, Missouri. Uh, yeah, Francis McDormand and um, Sam Rockwell were just incredible in this. It's a, uh, it was, and I give it credit for dealing with such miserable ideas. Like it is such a s dark setup for a film. The fact that this it's supposed to be this woman's daughter was uh, raped while dying, and they haven't found a break in the case. And but it's the fact that there's actually a lot of dark humor in this film that it definitely kept you smiling throughout, even through all the misery. Uh, every character has a fantastic arc, and I love the fact that, except for Sam Rockwell in the first half, no one's portrayed as the villain. They make it very clear that Woody Harrelson's, uh, they make it clear that F Frances McDormand, this is kind of just her way of dealing with grief, and Woody Harrelson really has done all you can tr he can to try to solve this case, because... I liked how this film brought up the fact that I think most people don't realize there are just a lot of cases that can never be solved, because if there's not an eyewitness account and there's no DNA in the system, they really can't do anything, so. That's the honorable mentions. Like I said, sorry there was so many, but it was a fantastic year for film. Now let's move on to the top 10 of 2017. But quick thing before we start the top 10, there is one film I put on this list that arguably did not come out in 2017, so I decided to tie it with another movie, just so... If you do not accept the fact it came out in 2017, then then just there's another film on that spot for you. So, yeah, let's move on to the top 10. So, my number 10 pick, all I can say about this one is, you know, it's my list, so if you don't accept this film, oh well. Can I have?
had your attention. You're all dismissed. Bankrupt. Better luck with your next job. I am not a stranger to the dark. <sighs> this is not the life I promised you. Not even close. Because we don't want your broken parts. Girls, I think I've had an idea. So yeah, The Greatest Showman, yeah, I, it, it's corny as hell, it's such a stupid movie, but I'd be lying if I, if I didn't, if I said that I didn't smile harder at any film this year than when uh, I gotta see a dance, a dance off between Hugh Jackman and Zac Efron, and that's, that's what The Greatest Showman did for me. It made me smile more than any other film did this year, it's just... Because even though it is just such a corny film, it's such charismatic actors with such fantastical, huge spectacle of musical numbers, and that's why The Greatest Showman gets my number 10 spots. Now for my number 9 picks, uh, like I said on my honorable mentions, it was either this film or The Disaster Artist. I decided to go with this film because I feel this is more important of the two movies this year. This was fun. Wait, we haven't even had sex again yet. I'm just not that kind of girl. I only have sex once on the first date. I'm just gonna <laughs> call an Uber. <laughs> your driver will be ready as soon as he puts on his pants. Is your bad man? Watch and learn, bye. Oh, crust. I have to tell you something, bye. I've been dating this girl. She's white. A white girl? Hey, you can't look like you and me, a white girl. It's okay. We hate terrorists. So, The Big Sick, uh, based off the real-life relationship of comedian uh, Kumail Najini, I hope that's how you say his name, and his actual wife, um, this film is the... I heard pretty close version of the story of what actually happened. I heard the only major difference is that they were still together when she fell ill originally, but... Anyway, it's just it's basically just a rom-com just uh, with some really good drama. The comedy is absolutely excellent. It had some of the funniest lines in cinema recent cinema I can remember. All the acting is incredible and uh just like I said, just the fact that the start this is a film that's about a relationship between a Muslim man and a white woman. I feel this definitely holds more gravity nowadays considering what our current administration thinks about uh, Muslims at the moment, so, but anyway, so, yeah, there, and there's one line in this film that I just thought was so perfect in which there's a scene in which, uh, Kumail Najini is, uh, just doing a stand-up set at, at the club, and then some heckler in the audience says, dude, go back to ISIS, and then he's like, oh, no, nah, you caught me, man, I'm an ISIS agent, that's why I'm trying to keep a low cover by be uh, being a stand-up comedian, thought that would really make me go unnoticed, so, uh, yeah, um, just, uh, The Big Sick. Just a fantastic rom-com from beginning to end, and yeah, I loved it. Uh, so, number nine, The Big Sick. Now for number eight, uh, my number eight spot goes for the war movie that was like no other and completely restored my faith in Christopher Nolan. The enemy tanks have stopped. Why? Why waste precious tanks when they can pick us off from the air like fish in a barrel? There are 400,000 men on this beach. Oh, Dunkirk! Um, I was really done with Christopher Nolan before this film. I was just thought his films just got kept, kept getting worse and worse. Like, I hated Interstellar. I thought that was one of the most pretend, obnoxiously pretentious films ever made. But Dunkirk, I mean, this is just... I thought this was just an incredible movie. I mean... I have heard the complaint that, like, there's no real big action, it's a very simplistic film. Yeah, there's not much dialogue in this film, and as I always say, I, I'm pretty sure you don't ever see a Nazi in this entire film, but that's what makes the movie so fantastic. It's the fact that it's a war film like no other for the fact it's an incredibly quiet movie from beginning to end, because... Dunkirk was not a battle by any stretch of the imagination. It was evacuation that nobody thought was going to work, and basically it was just, a, like, what was it, 400,000 men sitting on the beaches at Dunkirk just essentially just waiting to die for the Nazis to show up and just kill them all, and... 
Yeah, that was that was Dunkirk, um, and this film just does a great job. It has fantastic cinematography, fantastic sound design. I thought uh, Mark Rylance gave actually I thought was one of the most underrated performances of the year. I thought he was fantastic. Uh, gave a fantastically sell performance as uh, basically the representation of all the people that uh, sailed out to pick up soldiers in Dunkirk. So, yeah, uh, Dunkirk, uh, truly a war film like no other, and uh, yeah, so. Number 8, Dunkirk. Now for my number 7 pick, this pick goes to a film that had one of the greatest uh, starring performances of the year, even though the main actress was only 6 years old when shooting this. Thanks for calling the Magic Castle, Amber. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I warned you. One drip and you're out. Oh, come on! Out now. It's gonna melt outside. It's melting inside, too. But, Bobby... Out. Thank you very much. You're not welcome! So, the Florida Project, I mean, like I said, the fact that Brooklyn Prince was only six years old when she shot the movie, and she carries the movie. Like, I don't think there's a single... Uh, there's barely a scene that she's not in, and... She's just incredible. Willem Dafoe gives one of the, I think, the performance of his career as a very tired and jaded but caring uh, motel owner of the motel she lives in. And, yeah, and the best thing besides the acting, though, the best thing about this movie is I just had no idea this was an actual big part of the Florida population. All these broke people who basically just live in the budget motels near Disney. And it is always so interesting just when you see such poverty just like and you keep being reminded by such wealth that's literally r that they're right in the middle of like such wealth and tourism like you keep they keep referencing like they live on seven dwarfs lane there's a scene where like you can see fireworks and you clear it's i'm guessing it's supposed to be from the magic castle and yeah it's just such a bizarre feeling just knowing that this is an actual thing that exists and um well, and yeah so uh, the florida project fantastic acting and just a piece a slice of life film of a part of a life i didn't know existed so yeah number seven the florida project number six all i can say about this film is goddamn clowns <laughs> So yes, it's uh, the horror hits of 2017, uh, I loved it, I thought it was a fantastic horror movie. I have heard the complaints that it's not particularly scary, Pennywise the Clown, I would I would argue, yeah, it's not scary in like, it's a creepy kind of way, but it's just more upsetting because, I mean, this film showed the level of balls it had from the word go for the fact that the opening scene, it shows an adorable seven-year-old get his arm bit off in graphic detail. I mean, Jesus Christ, but it's not just that, though. What really made this work movie work, though, is even though it's sold on the killer clown, it's actually a very heartwarming story of friendship at its core, and... Yeah, that's just what makes it work, is all the kids are so relatable, you completely buy into their friendship, all the kid actors are just fantastic, and so, uh, yeah, number six, it. Now for number five, this is the most polarizing film of the year, I'm pretty sure, and I'm on the side who thought this was a, just a brilliant masterpiece through and through. When I found you, I saw raw. Untamed power. And beyond that, something truly special. Yeah, Star Wars The Last Jedi. Let me say this right now I am not an uber fan of Star Wars by any stretch of the imagination. I. I think they're. Some of them are really great action adventure films, like fantasy adventure films. I've just never been a huge fan of them, and 
Yeah, but this one though, like, so don't so don't cry fanboyism at me when I say that when I place that in my number five spot because. This film, like, it basically, for a Star Wars film to be good in my eyes, it does have to stand on its own, and this film is just absolutely brilliant, I thought. I mean, it was the most darkest, most thought-provoking, most... Just, it, in my opinion, like, from a narrative, most narratively memorable film of the entire series, I mean... Just, they did every, like, I know all the fanboys, like, cried foul how this movie just didn't, basically did not turn into the remake of The Empire Strikes Back, and I'm sure they really, what is what they really want, wanted, and, uh, this film did everything, the brave choice, I mean, Mark Hamill, I mean, I thought that was absolutely brilliant, the fact that instead of being some old wise old sage, he's actually a sad, pathetic failure in this film, also, and... It led to Mark Hamill and giving the performance of his career, in my opinion. I thought he was just excellent in this movie. Just how how he, he took basically the main hero of the original trilogy and just made him such a loser in this one. Uh, the ideas were thought-provoking, and more than any other film, it really brought the idea of how easy it can be to give in to the darkness, essentially, or the dark side, and, uh, and it does so in such a thought-provoking way, like, when you learn what exactly drove Kylo Ren crazy exactly, because that's what Kylo Ren is, he's just a man who's clearly just mentally, like, spiraling in this film, he's not, he knows he's not some sort of super, like, evil, like, menacing presence like Darth Vader, he knows he's Pathetic, really. That's who Kylo Ren is. He's a pathetic, like, mentally unstable, like, guy, and that's what he, that, and when you learn what drove him crazy, it's incredibly effective, um, had some of the best imagery of any Star Wars scene, had one of the best lightsaber scenes of any Star Wars film, and, um, yeah, I just, I just thought this was such a brilliant film uh, for me to end, so number five, Star Wars The Last Jedi. So my number four pick goes to what was, hands down, the best superhero film of 2017. Logan, what did you do? Charles, the world is not the same as it was. Mutants. They're gone now. I hurt myself today to see if I still feel. I focus on the pain, the only thing that's real. Where is she? Beneath the stain. She's like you. Of time. Very much like you. The feeling. Disappear. She needs our help. You are someone to come along. Someone has come along. I am still right here. So Logan, I mean, my God, what? Uh, this is a superhero film, like superhero film, like no other. I mean, it's not a superhero film uh, at first. This really is a basically an old school western that just happens to star the Wolverine and. Just, it was just so good. I remember, I remember when, um, Deadpool came out, I was really nervous, like a lot of people, that the only lesson, uh, studio executives were gonna take from that film is hard art comic books sell when, no, it, they, they work if it's appropriate for this to be an R-rated, uh, superhero film, and I'm glad that this seems like all studio executives have taken that lesson to heart, cause, really, there was just, this is the first, uh, R-rated, uh, superhero film since Deadpool, and, my god, was this film so much better for the R rating. I mean, the action is bloody and brutal. The acting, Hugh Jackman, I mean, this is the definitive performance of the Wolverine, uh, Logan. He was so incredible. Uh, Patrick Stewart uh, also turns in a fantastic last performance as Professor X. Uh, Daphne King as uh, the X-23. What, what a year for child performers it was. I mean, between... And... Because she was just as excellent as anyone from it or uh, the Florida Project, and it's just such a fantastically grim movie about a man at the end of his life and the what we leave behind, and yeah, I just love this movie. If you did not shed a tear at the end of that, at the end of the film, I'm sorry to say you have no soul. So, uh, and all I can say is, Marvel. I mean, with that final shot that they gave the film, like. 
Marvel, like, I know you're about to acquire Fox, and so you're gonna get, gonna get the rights to the X-Men and Fantastic Four, and my guess is your next big move will be, um, for the next wave of Marvel films, it will just be the X-Men and Fantastic Four mainly, and great, do that, but seriously, skip Wolverine if you can't get Hugh Jackman to return, because I really don't think anyone would be willing to accept anyone but Hugh Jackman as the Wolverine after this film, because this cemented him as one of the, as the greatest Wolverine we could ever hope for, and in my opinion, this was the greatest superhero film ever made, so number four, Logan. Now for my number three pick, uh, this was the film that got 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, and I'd say, yeah, it definitely deserved it. I hate California. I want to go to the East Coast. I want to go where culture is, like How New York. How in the York, world did I raise Or at least snob. Connecticut or New Hampshire, where, where writers live in the get woods. Get into those schools anyway. Mom! You should just go to City College. You know, with your work ethic, just go to City College and then to jail, and then back to City College, and then maybe you'd learn to pull yourself up and not expect everybody to do everything. <laughs> so, Lady Bird, um... It's just, what can I say about this film? It's just an incredibly relatable uh, coming-of-age story. It is surprisingly really funny. Like, I thought this would be, like, more of a serious drama. No, this is actually an incredibly funny movie. Like, everyone just speaks in such a matter-of-fact way. Like, everyone says exactly what's on their mind. The, uh... Uh, Saoirse Ronan is just incredible as Lady Bird. I'm always just amazed how well she's able to hide that Irish accent of hers. And, uh, Mary Metcalf was incredible as her mother. Um, so acting was great, uh, themes were relatable, and it was just so funny. So, uh, yeah, Lady Bird, this is my, that's my number three. So, number two, uh, this pick goes to the sci-fi epic of 2017. And when I say epic, this film was an epic. Every civilization was built off the back of a disposable workforce. But I can only make so many. Shh. Happy birthday. Blade Runner 2049. Let me say this right now, I was not a fan of the original Blade Runner. Like, I think it's a good movie, I enjoy it, but like, I, I don't think it's an untouchable masterpiece that a lot of people say it is because my big problem was, I thought all the f uh, philosophy with Rutger Hauer and his whole, whole character was really great. Like, his whole big monologue at the end of the film when he decides to save Harrison uh, save Harrison Ford because, as he puts him to be dead in a few minutes anyway, so what's the point of killing you? And, um... And, uh, but uh, the rest of the movie, though, like, the whole, what's supposed to be the big emotional hook to the film, the relationship between Harrison Ford and Sean Young, I mean... Those two hated each other, and anytime someone tells me that, I'm like, yeah, and it showed on set. Like, it was so, they had such horrible chemistry through and through in that film, and I really couldn't care less about that aspect. But this is a sequel that does what a good sequel does. It takes what worked about the original and expands it and gets sort of what didn't work. So instead of just obnoxious romance for hours on end, instead, this film was a sci-fi epic that was just just moral philosophy of ideas of consciousness AI the existence uh, choice and it is all so fantastic the acting is just incredible the visuals this one was visually stunning films I have ever seen like one of the best looks at the future uh, Ryan Go Gosling's a fantastic uh, replicant uh, Harrison Ford I mean this may be the performance of his career right here I thought he was just so good at it. I got more chemistry when he's talking about Sean Young's character in this film than I ever get, did between any scene um, in uh, the original when they were actually together. Uh, Anna J. Armas, uh, she was one of the most fascinating AI characters ever in film, and uh, Sylvia Hoax, I mean, she was a horrifying replicant, I mean, and the fact that this woman was able to look completely reasonable while beating the shit out of Ryan Gosling, I mean, that is truly impressive, but it's just, and it's just so good. I can't believe this was made one year after arrival from the same director. I can't imagine how he was able to make this film that fast because it feels like this was a film that was being made over like 30 years and it's just so good, it's so precise, it's so beautiful, it's so thought-provoking. Blade Runner 2049, while I will say Arrival's my favorite sci-fi film ever in my, actually, Arrival's my all-time favorite sci-fi film, like, 
This is still a fantastic sci-fi film and one of the all-time best I've ever seen, so number two, Blade Runner 2049. So for my number one, well, uh, remember that whole thing how I said I'm going to put a film that arguably did not come out in 2017 on my list? Well... <laughs> Let's hit the cafe later. Thanks, but I gotta go to work. I can't stand this place anymore. It's too small and close-knit. Please leave me a Tokyo boy my next life! Where am I? I've been having some strange dreams lately. Like a dream about someone else's life. What is this? <gasps> What this? What this mean? In our dreams, that girl and I were switching places. So your name, highest grossing anime of all time, one of the considered one of the best animes of all time, and I just absolutely adored this movie. I mean, I see everything, and this film, I mean. Well, just from the start, I thought it was a, a clever idea for a, and creative idea for a plot. The fact I was like, okay, do with the body switching um um plot device, but. Um, and make it a love story. I was like, okay, that's creative. Then it became more creative with the whole idea. Oh, it's two people who have never met each other before. That's a really creative idea. I've never seen that before. And then, even though I thought I knew exactly where this film was going, I knew where only a third of this film was going. This is one of the most creative, most unpredictable films I've ever seen in my life. I mean, this is, in my opinion, the most creative love story ever brought to cinema. The animation is just jaw-dropping, go jaw-droppingly gorgeous. Especially the image of the calm in the sky. That is just stunning. The characters are lovable. I mean, just I was in a complete packed uh, packed house when I saw this originally, and like I just it was anime nerd wall to wall, and um, just I heard so much crying, so much people just grasping their seat in terror, myself included. It just. It left so many people burst into tears and applaud at the final scene, and it's just such a fantastic anime that just so fantastically pulls on all your heartstrings, and it's just incredible. So, number one, your name. But your name, like I said, technically did not, arguably did not come out in 2017, uh, uh, so that's why we're going to put another film for my number one spot, and that has to be the horror movie of 2017, hands down. You got your toothbrush? Check. Do you have your deodorant? Check. Do you have your cozy clothes? Got that. What? Do they know I'm black? Should they? You might wanna, you know? Mom and Dad, my black boyfriend will be coming up this weekend. I just don't want you to be shocked that he's a black man. <laughs> I ain't never seen you like this before, bro. Meeting family and taking road trips. Don't come back all bougie, man. Come back, get your damn pants up to your damn stomach. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, Get Out, I mean, <laughs> this movie was just brilliant. It is such a brilliant movie, Get Out. The acting's fantastic, the social uh, the social commentary is spot on, The it's creepy, it's funny, it has one of the most single satisfying kills I've ever seen in a film. I can't remember the last time I burst into a plot to see a character getting shot, po uh, shot point blank in the chest. Um... <laughs> Allison Williams, I thought, gave one of those underrated performances of the year. I'd say watch the film, then watch it again. You can notice all these small little touches she gives to her performances in the uh, to her performance in the first half. Um, and it's just such a brilliant horror film with such great social commentary, and I just loved it. This was, this was some of the most fun I ever had in a movie theater. Was uh, seeing this with like a, with opening night with just a completely f filled house. I mean. It was just, it's just a fantastic horror film. Even if you don't like horror movies, it's like watching, because it's really not that scary, but it's just so clever, and I just love it. So, yeah, that's uh, number one, Get Out. So, to go through my top ten one more time quickly, uh, number ten, The Greatest Showman, number nine, The Big Sick, number eight, Dunkirk, number seven, The Florida Project, number six, It, number five, Star Wars, The Last Jedi, number four, Logan, Number three, Lady Bird. Number two, Blade Runner 2049. Number one, Your Name. If you don't accept that, Get Out. And uh, if you're wondering which film I like more, Your Name or Get Out, I'd say Your Name on the whole, but that may just come to the fact that 
far less people have seen your name, so I try to get much uh, more people to watch that uh, instead of Get Out, because most people have seen Get Out, but, uh... So yeah, just what an incredible year for film. I mean, so many masterclass films in so many different genres. We had sci-fi, we had war, we had rom-coms, we had anime, we had horror. Just what a, a brilliant year for film it was. My guess is 2018 cannot possibly be as good as this year, but hey, fingers crossed. Cause, and if not, I can still say 2017, one of the best years for film I can remember. So... Yeah, that's my top 10 of 2017. YouTube, as always, please subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Okay, bye.